Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome. Um, I'm so excited to be here to talk about some of my learnings in helping large enterprises accelerate and transform their business on AWS using experience-based accelerator. Um, my name is Vyas Raj Kulkarni, and I know it's hard to uh, recollect the name, and you can call me Vyas. And I'm an enterprise technology leader uh, in AWS. And as part of my role, I have the privilege to work with a lot of large enterprises and help them accelerate the journey onto AWS and unblock a lot of uh, blockers they have as an enterprise to onboard onto AWS. Today in this session, I'll be covering three things. One, talk about what is experience-based acceleration. Two, how our customers are using experience-based acceleration, uh, acceleration techniques uh, to accelerate their journey into AWS. And for that, I would have our esteemed customer from SAP Kunker, Cameron Etizadi, joining us shortly and talking about his experience, how they've leveraged experience-based acceleration within SAP Kunker and moved close to 700 microservices in just three months. And he'll be able to share those learnings with you. And thirdly, how you can actually use this new innovative technique when you go back into your organization and ensure that you onboard yourself onto AWS rapidly. <clears throat> now consider this, right? Um, the normal SMP companies have an average lifespan of 15 years today. And if you take a step back, way back in 19, um, way back in 1920s, the average lifespan used to be close to 67 years. Now the lifespan has reduced from 67 years to about 33 years in 1960s and 70s, and now it is 15 years. And what it is estimated is that it will be 12 years by the time we get to 19, uh, 2027. Now, this is significant data. You know, what it means is that if you look at the current churn of this, uh, every seven to eight years, we will have close to 50% of these large SMP customers or SMP companies uh, now being replaced. And this is a huge concern for the C-suite, right? Because their existence is, is in question and they're focusing a lot more in terms of how they can change the customer, how the customer behavior is changing and how they can change their enterprise to cater to those customer requirements. And to do this, uh, we are seeing that at least 90% of these customers are using a cloud-first strategy. And rightly so, uh, because this is the only way they can actually address to the demands which market is actually putting on them. But even though you have 90% of them thinking about cloud-first strategy, close to two-thirds of their IT budget is still spent on maintenance and non-value-added activities. Now, this is cre creating a huge pressure on the C-suite, uh, and they're seeing a huge business value gap, which they are not able to address, uh, simply because a lot of their IT budget is now being spent only more on maintenance. And this is where we are being asked a lot by these large enterprises in terms of how can we plug this uh, business value gap? And is there a way the cloud can help us enable this? A lot of our successful enterprises have actually done this in a more efficient way. For example, GE has moved close to around 2,000 applications into AWS and potentially saved almost close to 50% of the TCO cost by doing this. And obviously, this is a huge first step for a lot of com companies, but they're not leaving here just with cost savings. Uh, we have many other enterprises which have actually taken this further beyond and used AWS uh, to gain st uh, staff efficiency, staff productivity, uh, operational resilience, and also business agility. For example, Sage Group is a company uh, which has saved close to around 500 
hours of their engineers' time by actually moving the software into AWS. Now, prior to AWS, uh, they had their engineers actually go to individual locations to install and configure their ERP system. Uh, now, everything is done on the cloud, and they're now getting back the 500 hours of precious time from their engineers who are now focusing on some value-added services for their customers. Uh, so with Expedia. Now, Expedia, after they moved to AWS, they've been able to get significant gains in terms of their SLAs and also uh, reduce their deployment times for the new releases. The way they have done this is by actually using the multi-AZs and regions of AWS. And now they're giving their customers a much better service. And that's where you, you see a lot of people using Expedia to book their journeys. And they're getting a lot of business value through that. And last but not the least, Intuit is now able to do new releases of their features five times faster than what they used to do before. Now again, I was talking about the market pressure where companies are literally replaced in 10 years. Uh, giving these new releases based on the customer requirements is significant, and Intuit is able to do this across its product lines. And this is enabling them to stay ahead in the market game. Now what does this mean, right? So if you look at the pattern here, most of these companies always started very simple. Uh, they just tried to get the benefits of the cloud as AWS platform, and they eventually, through experience, learned what would work well for them and leverage the features of AWS to make it work for the functionality or business workflows which were relevant to their business, and that's where they've been extremely successful. Now, one of the other challenges which we see enterprises face in terms of adoption is the old IT decision mechanisms which they use. We call this as a one-door decision-making policy. How many of you understand what is a one-door decision-making policy? Okay, few of them, but just in interest of others. Uh, the one-way door is that these are decisions which are irreversible or nearly irreversible. So what I mean by this is, in the past, when enterprises thought about investing on data centers, they would do a long lead analysis in terms of identifying what the capacity should be, how it should work like, and then spend close to a year even to decide what should be actually invested. And once they make that decision, it's always hard to come back. And these are one-way door decisions, and a lot of long lead analysis happens. Now, unfortunately, many of these enterprises use the same one-way decision mechanism even on cloud. To go a little more deeper, what it means is that when they think about onboarding onto AWS, uh, most of these enterprises creates, create a business case, which is usually based on assumptions. Um, and the business case usually comprises of business value, what is the total cost of ownership, uh, what is the return on investment, what is the cost saving you get, uh, what is the cost to achieve and would I get operational efficiencies, right? These are the parameters through which a business case is made. And they take a lot of time to actually do that. And because they haven't done anything on cloud, there is no lighthouse reference which will give them a view of what's the real value they get from the business. And also, most of the other elements or the attributes are based on assumptions. Now, the issue with that is, if any of these assumptions gets invalidated, the whole business case falls flat on its face. And we have seen this in numerous cases. And even if one assumption goes wrong, uh, the whole adoption journey uh, is actually stalled. Uh, this is where we have a lot of our enterprises asking us this question of how can we move away from this one-way door decision making and get into a mechanism of having a two-way door decision making, which means that it's not an irreversible decision. Uh, you make some assumptions, move ahead, validate those assumptions. If it fails, you always can come back and, and explore and experiment and do something more. Uh, and by doing this, you can actually move, replace your assumptions with insights. Uh, let me give you a quick example of what is replacing assumptions with insight. Um, in this business case, I'll take cost to achieve as an example. 
Now, large enterprises actually look at their application portfolio and think about what does it take to move this application portfolio into AWS. And usually they segment this into a group of applications and then say some of these will be re-hosted, some of these will be refactored, and perhaps many of these would be re-engineered. Now, for our example purpose, I'll just pick a re-host. And if, if an enterprise thinks about creating a business case, they'll say to re-host an application, just as an example, uh, it might take 10 days to move an, ex uh, move an application from on-premise to AWS. But in reality, when a developer starts working on it, they realize that the developer will have to now first create a ticket uh, to get a compute instance. Now, usually these tickets have SLAs associated with it. I'm sure most of you uh, can relate to this, that these SLAs can take anywhere between a few days and perhaps goes to a few weeks as well. Um, and then you get a compute instance only to realize that you can't do anything with it because um, there is no firewalls enabled by the security team. So the developer has now, uh, developer needs to now raise a ticket with the security team and get access to the systems. And the security team would have their own questions. Usually they're considered the biggest blockers. And by this time, developer is wondering, what is happening here? It doesn't stop here. Um, from here, uh, obviously, uh, we have seen scenarios where developers will have to now raise a ticket with the networking team, and then subsequently raise another ticket with database team and multiple other teams. And you see that each of these teams will be working in silos. And at the end of it, you can totally relate to this if you're an enterprise, the developer is extremely frustrated. Now, enterprises are actually looking at how can we get out of the situation? Now, on top of this, if you think about it, in the cost to achieve, there's an assumption made that it takes only 10 days to move this application. But in reality, just to set an environment, what, what people would have assumed that it would take two days, now takes more than two to four weeks. And if you compound this with the number of applications you're thinking about moving into AWS, this breaks the whole business case. And this is one of the major reasons why we have seen enterprises stall their journey onto AWS. And this is where we've been asked by a lot of these customers in terms of, we know we can get a lot of benefit from AWS. Can you tell us how can we do it? And we listen to our customers a lot, and then we created this mechanism called as experience-based acceleration. So experience-based acceleration is a way in which we break the silos, which you saw in my previous example, and create a cross-functional team to help unblock many of these enterprise uh, challenges and blockers, and then allow the development team to be more agile in terms of creating new features and releasing it instead of uh, doing that in weeks, it'll be done in days. And typically we do experience-based acceleration in three to five days. Now we call this a party uh, within our ecosystem. So we call this as a platform party or a migration party based on what we are trying to address because usually experience-based acceleration will have an outcome which would be to create either a landing zone which is when we call it a platform party or move an application which is migration party or it could be creating a completely new workflow or a business application on AWS. Now what we are doing with this is actually changing the way our customers work because we are breaking the silos where you saw multiple teams involved to just move few applications into AWS, which includes your network, security, operations, and obviously the development teams. And we find close to around 12 to 15 teams in each, each of the enterprise. And then create a cross-functional team and change the way you work, which is more relevant uh, to the cloud. And along with that, uh, we also get rid of the waterfall process, which is waiting on tickets one after the other, and then make it more agile. And also help them not wait for a long lead process and actually get actions immediately because you're now getting all of these people in one room and their whole goal is to go towards an outcome of moving the entire application into the AWS. And finally, 
in each of these experience-based acceleration sessions, there would be an outcome. And the outcome is either mowing the services, which is very relevant to your enterprise, and this is not a POC or a Hello World application. These are real business applications which you would be using every day. And then learning how your organization can transform itself to be more efficient in doing that. If I need to tell this in one line, it's about working towards a common objective and outcome, but celebrating each other's success. And this is where all teams are now gathered together for a single outcome, which is to transform their business into AWS. Now, I want to quote one of our customers here, which is AXA Belgium. And this is a quote given by Peter Nautiliar, uh, who actually presented in our New York Summit. And I just took this slide because I found it an extremely nice way of representing what EBA is. Now, if you look at large enterprises, they find themselves as kid trying to explore how to swim in the new world of cloud. And the only way to learn swimming here would be to actually jumping into it, jumping into the water. And the water here is cloud uh, in its analogy. Uh, and then, if you look at it, EBAs would be the floaty around the kid, which will help that kid not to sink and learn in the process. And if you look at the most important thing is the expression on the face of the kid. The kid is happy, the kid is having fun. It's not about just transforming yourself, but while doing that, having some good amount of fun is motto of what EBA is. And this is exactly uh, something which has come from the words of our customer, which is Peter Nautilas from AXA. Now I'm just taking that a little further in terms of how the EBA in AXA went through. This is a real dashboard of what happened after one session of EBA in AXA Belgium. Um, they were able to, the most important statistics which I want to talk about here is uh, the participants feeling after this exercise. If you're in an enterprise, you'll realize how difficult change is. Uh, and it's very hard to change an existing process into new way of working. And in this case, when, within three days, when all the teams were actually gathered together, you actually saw uh, people actually uh, working together and ensuring that they have the outcome given and there was a positive outcome here. And then they were able to address 12 big ticket items. And these are typically the blockers which enterprise face um, when they need to move towards a AWS. And these blockers were addressed within a matter of three days instead of months. And then finally, during this party, there were five new features added to their landing zone which allowed them to ensure that they can move their, secure, their applications which needed regulatory needs uh, into AWS. Uh, so all of this being done in three days was incredible. And if you look at the outcome, they were able to move all three applications within this three days. Now this is about experience-based acceleration. Now what I'm gonna talk about next is how do you do this? You, the way we do this is by actually throwing a party. And who else can help us understand how to throw a party better than our esteemed customer Cameron Atazadi, who's from SAP Kankar. And he threw a big party in SAP, and they were able to migrate 700 microservices in three months. So I would like to now welcome Cameron Atazadi on stage to talk about his experience on AWS. Thanks, Vyas. So Cameron, when we were talking, you were talking about two things, that how EBAs helped you resolve some of the bottlenecks across people, process, and systems, and also how you could accomplish uh, things which you could not do in three months, in three days within the EBA. Can you tell more about your SAP scenario and how did EBA help you in SAP? Sure, it, it opened up our eyes, it was amazing, and I'm not a newbie to AWS by any means. Um, it's been almost 10 years now that I've been playing with the services of AWS. We've certainly moved stuff into the cloud before, and yet we were stuck. We were completely stuck. We'd even been playing with AWS almost four years at Concur. It really helped us unblock ourselves and expose things in our organization that frankly, we were unaware of. Our perceptions of what was wrong was wrong. We're willing to admit that, which is cool. So I'm gonna take you guys on a little bit of a journey. I'm gonna tell you a little about us at SAP Concur, 
Um, show of hands, if I might, from the audience on how many of you use our product to do your expense reports. It's about what I thought. It looks about 75%, which matches up pretty well with the slide. Um, and I'm going to tell you where we came from and, and kind of where we're going. Um, my lawyers tell me I'm not allowed to give you a roadmap, so I'm just going to tell you things under what I call a friend EA uh, while you're here. We were founded back in 1993. And that's an early day process, and we sold software like everybody else sold it. We sold it on a compact disk. Uh, you went into your, to your system, you installed it on top of Microsoft SQL, you got a fat Java client, and away you went. We have 48,000 customers today from those humble beginnings. We're in 150 countries, and we have over 61 million end users. Uh, we see several million of these active sessions every single day of the year, uh, 365 days a year. Back in 2001, we made the switch to cloud only. We quit selling our on-premise software, and we became what those of you who have hair as gray as mine will realize was an ASP, or an application service provider. This is uh, before the marketing folks got a hold of it and started calling it SaaS. Um, it was an ASP. Uh, it, nearly, it nearly tanked the company. We were ahead of the curve in that regard. And we did it the same way everybody else did it. We built out data centers. We put the app in our data centers. We slapped a web UI on it. We called it good. And suddenly, we're a cloud company. Uh, this may sound familiar to some of you. 75% of the Fortune, 1000, or Fortune 100 and Fortune 500 companies now use our software, and it's still running in many cases, or many pieces of it are still running in some of those legacy data centers. Fortunately, we've gone from 486s to you know, the latest Intel and AMD boxes, but it's still there on hardware. And we're, we were still, as of a year or two ago, buying hardware. Thank God we're out of that business. We have over 2 million analytics reports crunching through incredible amounts of CPU every day as they run against our data lake to generate insights for our customers. About five years ago, which is strange enough, right around the time I joined the company, uh, that's actually no secret, uh, we got acquired by SAP. Uh, it was a great and successful exit. Uh, it was, at the time, the largest acquisition SAP had ever made for about $8 billion, and we're proud to be a part of Germany and Europe's largest software company. Uh, we're also very proud that we can bring assets to the table with SAP. Uh, but in order to do that, SAP's uh, given us not only resources, but customers. We were approximately a billion dollars in annual revenue uh, when we were acquired. We're now almost two billion in annual revenue in five years. We've gone from just under 5,000 employees to about 8,500 employees in this division. We are a significant market force and we've had significant growth. Uh, data centers don't grow as fast as our customer base has, uh, which is excellent. So we needed to do something different. Uh, that something different now involves almost $136 billion worth of customer expenses that we process every year and 336 million billable transactions. So that's everything from your Starbucks receipt to the flight that got you here to your hotel when you go back home. Just to kind of give you an idea of the scale that we process at, these are numbers from Q2 this year. Q2 is not our busiest time, Q4 is. Uh, and so I'll give you a little bit of updates kind of off the slideware. Uh, we did 272,000 trips on a single day. We did three quarters of a million expense reports. We're now over a million a day in Q4, and we expect to grow more. We're over 400,000, almost 500,000 trips on a busy day that people book through our platform. We do invoice processing, for those of you who don't know. I like to call it jokingly expense for corporations. We'll process your invoices and pay them. And we'll audit your expense reports if you want us to, using a mixture of artificial intelligence and rules-based folks to correct it. This creates almost a petabyte of data for us to maintain in our systems. And that's just data. That's not metadata. These are your image receipts. These are your expense reports, your line items, your travel bookings. It's a tremendous amount of data. On top of this, we go and we stuff logs. We stuff metrics. We have a pub-sub infrastructure that's running for our event-based architectures. We have all kinds of metadata uh, that we generate around this platform that we also have to control. And frankly, I don't know about you, but I don't want to keep buying obnoxious SAN devices and trying to wedge them into a data center. Uh, it's not pleasant, and there's just very little value for any of us racking and stacking stuff anymore. We weren't new to AWS, though. Uh, in prehistory, which to me that's pre-Cameron history, um, five years in this industry is, is a lifetime, as you're well aware, uh, but there's still more to do, and I'll keep doing it. We were a three-tiered model. Um, many of you are probably familiar with this model. It's how we used to write software back in the old days. It was a web tier. Uh, it could be anything you wanted. A middle tier, which was your entire application. Uh, we finally call these things monoliths today. 
and an RDBMS system. And let's face it, RDMS, RDBMS systems in modern architectures are close to irrelevant. Not completely, but, but damn near. Uh, we also had multiple platforms and languages available from our M&A activities. So Concur started as an expense-only company, and we bought a travel company. And I don't know about you, but we did a lot of M&A, which was all A, and there sure as heck was not a lot of M in that software stack. Um, I expect this is very familiar to a lot of you. Uh, this is not the first company I've been at where that's the case. Uh, so we acquired a company that had a .NET middle tier, uh, and it ran on Microsoft SQL Server, and we ran on Microsoft SQL Server, and we had a Java middle tier. And so we kind of glued the two together through uh, what we loosely called APIs. Um, for some definition, they met that, but they're terrible. And we used a lot of architecturally broken techniques to deliver our software. And let's face it, with 25 years of history, some of these are still there. We had stored procedures. We had triggers, right? These are considered just anti-patterns today, and they block you from going forward. We put business logic in the SQL in some cases. You know, worse than that, all of our data science was done through ETL jobs, uh, where we extracted stuff you know, in batches overnight, and we shared data stores. We not only coupled applications in these monoliths, we coupled data at the data layer. Right? All of these practices constrain your growth, so we had to fix some of this. Um, but at the same time, we also had to lift and shift this into AWS. So we've been on this journey for four years. We haven't stood still in the process. When I got there, there were some ops guys. They were kind of poking away at AWS. And I thought to myself, hey, this is great. The ops guys want to get out of the data center. Love my ops guys to be out of the data center. And they were poking around at it. But we had the bad software development practices. We had a dev team. We had a QA team. We had an ops team that ran it. You know, let's, let's forget about security and some of the other teams for a minute that were kind of running around peripherally trying to block things. I said, wow, if operations isn't a blocker, this is going to go well. Turns out, operations was a blocker. What they said and what they did were two very different things. First of all, they were trying to shift us in a colo model into AWS. We all know that doesn't work. You can't just lift and shift from your data center to AWS and ex expect to be successful with it. Right? Your cost model doesn't work, the infrastructure doesn't work, and the assumptions you make don't work. The second thing that they did was they made a bunch of corporate policy mistakes. So not only were they lift and shifting, they're looking at security like they're looking at security in a data center. We all know security in the cloud is not a network problem. If your security guy comes up to you and says, let's put a firewall here as the first thing with security, he's probably not the guy you want doing security. Security in the cloud is an identity problem in 2019. It's been an identity problem for 10 years. So networking is a great defense in depth, but it's not, it's, not the, uh, corporate, it's not the corporate gold standard for this. And yet those guys were trying to come in on a networking layer, so they're getting in the way. We actually, I began to actually call fear and obstruction in the environment a core skill. Well, we can't do that because ops hasn't signed off. Well, ops didn't get the requirements from products, so products got to do it. Well, it didn't get prioritized as an executive level. It was a lot of finger pointing and a lot of blaming and a lot of trying to wrap things so that we had no forcing function as a result to get us all into there. We needed something to, to make this happen. So our first attempt was actually a couple years ago. Um, we spun up AWS in China as a China-based data center, and we run our China instance. We have three instances worldwide, a North America, a European, and a China data center. And our China one runs actually 100% in AWS. But it is very much a colo lift and shift. The project was actually done not by development, but by operations. And it runs just about as poorly as you would expect if that were, if that were to be the case. So we really needed a forcing function to pick this up and do it the right way. And so what we did uh, was it turned out we suddenly won a contract with the United States government, uh, a large public sector contract for the very largest part of those in government service. Um, my lawyers tell me I'm not allowed to, to tell you in the presentation who it is, but it's a matter of public record on the federal, uh, on the federal government. We won the Department of Defense. So we are providing travel expense services to them, uh, and it's a huge customer. In fact, it's larger than our next seven largest customers put together. We're super proud of our men and women who serve, and we're super proud that we can deliver for them, but it also comes with a hard deadline. Um, I'm going to ask another show of hands questions. Does the three letters ATO strike fear in the heart of anybody else in the audience? I see at least one hand. It's the authority to operate, and it's basically the paperwork that lets you run for the government. It's not a pretty thing. So we had to do some changes, right? I look at things through a lens of three different views. I'm an engineer at heart. Um, who just happened to kind of eke his way up the management chain. 
Um, so I like to, to break things into categories and systems. And so one of them for me is I like to look at this in terms of people, process, and systems. How do I change all three of these to make myself successful in AWS? So number one is the people have to change. There are skills that are different. There are things that people now do in AWS because they own the stack as a full stack engineer, and I hate that term um, because I don't believe they really exist, but as a full stack engineer, in AWS, you have to understand how you deploy, how you operate, how you monitor, what's your operational hygiene for your platform. This takes a different culture. It takes a customer-centric culture where we're, we're focused on delivering value to our customers, not being you know, the best nerd in the room, which I love to be, but it's not, and putting KPIs in place that monitor that. The second thing we had to fix was process, uh, where the process is built to enable scale and is optimized for KPIs that you want to see, which in our case is you know, responsiveness, availability, and frankly, a deadline. And then the systems you put in place to back those underpin that process. So we have a ticketing system in place. It's actually a fine ticketing system. Um, we call it Service Never uh, instead of its actual name. And it has nothing to do with the software, which is excellent. It has everything to do with how we've chosen to implement it. Uh, I'm sure some of you can possibly relate. And so we had to go and change some of this in the process, and we tried to boil the ocean. Mostly we tried to boil our people alive uh, in this process, and it didn't work so well. So we were stuck. We had a very hard deadline. I'll tell you, I'll tell you all up front, it was November 1st this year, uh, to have the beginnings of our implementation to satisfy our public sector contract. Um, we didn't think we were going to make it. I, I sat down with, with my manager, my boss, um, who's the CTO for the cloud side of, of SAP, and I said, look, Michael, I, I have strong doubts about us making the deadline. And I was talking with our ProServe people, uh, who are fantastic, Vias is, is part of that wonderful organization, and they said, well, you know, we have this new program going on. We have this EBA. I said, why don't you consider doing this EBA? And so I, I went away and I said, do you want to do what? I am on a deadline where I don't have enough time to make it, and you want me to take three days of engineering resources, which are the most valuable and expensive thing that I possess, take them out of what they're doing on these, let's call them well-planned sprints, put them in a room on something that I have no confidence is going to succeed. And, and uh, my, our pro-serve lead, Amanda Rankin, said, yes. So um, while I contemplated the odds of getting fired that afternoon uh, for even suggesting this, um, I started thinking about what else is going on in our organization. We had some leadership changes. So uh, in Concur, we actually combined our product and engineering divisions. So those product folks that had technical skills as well, or you know, some level of technical understanding, we kept in the engineering org, and we got rid of all the other product people and pushed them aside into a strategy organization. Um, so that helped facilitate alignment between product and engineering. Second thing is we won this public sector contract, which gave us a very clear set of requirements. If you've ever built for any kind of regulated environment, in our case, we're FedRAMP uh, and IL-4, uh, you know that there's a very clear set of guidelines from NIST that come in rainbow-colored books. They're very, very thick and make great nighttime reading uh, when the ambient doesn't work. And so we knew what we had to do, when we had to do it, and then we made some org structure changes. We actually found that since operations was a blocker and we could see this up front, we removed our head of operations and distributed those folks out to the various SVPs of engineering. Nevertheless, we had a lot of fear and self-doubt. Frankly, I had fear and self-doubt. But I committed to the process, and I want to just show you a video of what this process looks like while it's in flight, and then I'm going to go back and dissect the video. But I feel like, uh, I feel like if you get a feel for what it looks like, it'll, it'll make it clear. Vias wasn't kidding when there was a party going on. And we have no music. Oh, I'm sorry, we have no audio to this video. Uh, huh? Oh, you got it, you got it. Okay, I have it.
All right, so that's what it looks like. In fact, that's actually a, a montage of three of these that we held, uh, which I'll go into uh, in a moment and tell you about them. Um, I'm really proud. We have an engineering team of 1,500 people at uh, SAP Concur that build our software. We're spread across uh, almost, uh, I believe it's 15 development locations between the US and Europe that have significant presence. Uh, and uh, and it, it was, it's, it's, it's amazing to see. I, I look at this. So we did this for nine days. Uh, and it seems a little odd, but I committed to three days at our headquarters in, in Seattle. Uh, and we did it for three days in our headquarters in Seattle. And what happened at that event is I brought in the other, uh, I brought in all the SVPs of engineering to be there with me. I was the executive sponsor for this. And the SVPs of engineering were so impressed by what was accomplished, they said, we can't go back to our offices. Uh, one of them is in Minneapolis, the other's in Prague. He said, we can't go back to our offices and not do this there with our guys. And we had gone and flown these teams in from around the world, and they were talking about it all night on Slack, all night with their colleagues on email. Uh, and they're like, we have to keep doing this. We have to keep doing this. So we actually committed to doing two more of these. So that's how we got to nine days. Overall, through the organization, we brought in 25 teams uh, of engineers, scrum teams, for lack of a better term, teams of 10, whatever you want to call it. And they were across all disciplines. So we had platform guys. We had operations guys. We had networking guys, services guys in the room participating with this. What's even better about it is, as this was going on, we had 10 teams across the organization that were like, why are we not a part of this? We want to be a part of this. And they commandeered conference rooms in our buildings, kicked people out of the conference rooms, and started ordering pizza and participating. We live streamed all of this in the organization. They're like, yeah, we don't want to be at our desk. We want to do this, because it's way cooler. And I was, I was so gratified by that. I'm like, send me the bill for your pizzas and beer. Like, I will pay for that out of my morale budget. I don't care. I'm so, I'm so happy that you're a part of it. And we went upstairs and we tried to visit those teams and make sure that we not only encouraged them, but we could keep them going. Um, VS said we had 700 microservices deployed in, six, in three months. That's true. We did 19 services uh, during the EBA over these nine days, completely moved into AWS. But those services for us are bounded context. We consider travel to be the travel service, but there are hundreds of microservices that make that up on the back end. We consider spend to be a, ser a service. So these are 19 bounded contexts within our environment that we were able to get deployed. They moved 400 work items off of the backlogs and they moved 60, over 60 blockers out of the room. Um, every time during this presentation that a team does something successful, that team was supposed to ring a cowbell. Um, if you're a fan of Will Farrell like me in SNL, there were a lot of chants in the room of more cowbell every single day. We want more cowbell. I think this room needs more cowbell. So we rang them over 150 times. And when we did something super successful, a major piece of infrastructure, a major platform, I think you saw a gong in that video you know, that looks like it came out of a, a temple somewhere. We rang the gong. So it was super exciting. And just the racket, the cacophony in the room of these cowbells encouraged the teams to be somewhat competitive with one another. You know, why, haven't our, why hasn't our table rung the cowbell in a while? Um, but there were a lot of things that we discovered in this process. Um, it wasn't all roses and cowbells. Um, we discovered that we had three things that blocked us from scalable patterns. Um, and I will deep dive into each one of these. Number one is we had a monolith migration. That monolith migration uh, was really hard. Even though we've got a bunch of microservices, I'm carrying 25 years of legacy code. And a lot of it's in platforms that I don't want to be there. Funny enough, you heard about Andy getting rid of Windows in, in uh, the keynote yesterday. We're 100% down that path. In fact, I'm even trying to get rid of Linux in the way that I'm trying to build everything into distro-less containers, baseless containers, uh, and get it out there. So we, are, we have been uh, on Kubernetes for over three years now. I actually, I actually have a seat on the CNCF. Uh, we're huge supporters, but not all of our code's there. I'll freely admit we've still got Windows code there. We've still got SQL Server running, and we're doing our damnedest to get rid of it. Number two, security was an issue for us. Um, we're absolutely hyper-focused on information security. Our security team still looks at things like it's a network problem. So we were trying to get rid of that. We also, because we're in a highly regulated environment, have constraints on who can access that environment. And so some things, regardless of whether it's good or bad for security, have to change to appease the government. Third thing that we had was a legacy and regimented process uh, with a lot of tickets. You know, service never was not going to work for us in that room. Um, so the monolith to minilith migration has been going on for a while, right? A lot of teams said they made progress, and a lot of teams wrote 
you know, a few services that kind of tied back. And so we kind of had a monolith with a few moons orbiting it, maybe a comet streaking by up top. It wasn't, wasn't so great. Um, we started to really expose that. Um, we thought that, you know, we had a bunch of RDBMS systems. We actually kicked a couple of them out during this and got those teams 100% onto DynamoDB uh, as their storage layer. Um, we also decoupled some of those storage layers during this. Where we were able to find teams that said, you know what, I can just clone the code if I move that data out. The data is not coupled. So they did that. Um, we were able to get closer to closing our data center um, a little bit, which we'd like to do. We'd like to not renew our leases on our data center in the US. Um, and we actually worked on upgrading the encryption using some of the AWS native primitives around certificate management key ma and uh, key management stores uh, and secrets management. So this was great. We went to an API first model. Around security, we had to come in and start talking about zero touch. So we're really strongly a believer in a zero touch environment. Um, my public sector contract requires that only US citizens on US soil touch that code. Um, that's really hard when my second largest development center sits in the, Prague, in the Czech Republic in Prague. Right? Dollar for dollar, those are my best engineers that I've got. I've got a huge farm in Seattle. I've got Minneapolis, San Francisco, uh, DC, Dallas, Atlanta. But Prague, Prague does more work you know, per capita than anybody. I still need them in the environment. Um, we also use this as an opportunity to start our rollout of, a, of um, an SRE model. So I, in full disclosure, about, oh, man, I'm old now. 12 years ago, uh, I worked at Amazon on the dot-com side, uh, which is how I got early into AWS when there were just three services. Um, and Amazon's a very bunch of DevOps model. Either one's fine. But what it really means is the engineers have a significant part of operational responsibility for their code. Uh, and that was something that was very new to us. Most teams still believed in code goes to QA, QA goes to ops, ops goes to, to run it. And there's that breaking up of, of barriers down there. We also had some very complex landscapes, right? We talked about data residency, citizenship. We really wanted to get to the point of provable compliance as part of this. So we set some guardrails up going into this. We did prep. This is not a pull everybody into the room. This is we bootstrapped an environment with some of the permissions, some of the guardrails, some of the security we needed ahead of time as a tiger team. I leverage what I call a coalition of the willing to sit aside over Actually, it was, it was a couple of months, actually. I'm not going to lie. It was a couple of months of sitting there saying, OK, we need our root certificate in here so we can provision things. We need to get DNS set up. We need to get our external, um, we use Akamai. We need our web firewall and protection in front of this environment. A few of these things need to get set up before we can let these people go and party in the environment. Um, but we also said everything's got to be automated. So we had teams, this was actually consternation. We had a lot of teams that said, your environment can't be automated. And we said, in order for you to be successful at the EBA, you're going to automate this. And lo and behold, it all was. And then we had these legacy and regimented processes that also had to be changed. And this, was, this for me, was the biggest revelation of EBA. We actually thought it was our people. Um, I'm not going to lie. The, my uh, favorite head of engineering, my favorite SVP, uh, and I are sitting there, and we talk all the time, um, mostly because I control the architects and he controls the engineers, and so we have a, a good, healthy tension, and we're, we're good friends. There's uh, always scotch involved in these discussions. Um, he's like, I really thought we just had bad engineers. And I said, me too. I said, I paid for AWS training. I spent probably, I think, well into the six figures over the last two years on AWS training for my 1,500 engineers. Architecture training, DevOps training, ops training, development training. Why aren't they getting it? Why aren't we making more progress? Um, when we got in the room the first day, we saw that we actually had process blockers. We had process blockers in operations, which we already talked about. We had process blockers in security. Uh, the first day, the security guys got up there and said, so we're in the room, and we're going to tell you what you can and can't do in this environment. They stood up in front of everybody, and Vias and I kind of laughed a little bit. Uh, on day two, I took away their tables. So I forced them to take their chairs and sit among the other teams and become enablers in the room by physically removing any place for them to sit. Um, I've got to be honest with you. Uh, the first day, I wanted to play a little music and take away the chairs one by one from those guys. But HR told me that was really inappropriate, uh, and I wasn't allowed. So I settled for taking away their tables and pushing them out into the organization. Um, we got to the point the first day with those guys where they would literally say, hey, just file, file a ticket and we'll take a look at it, which meant that at some point during the day, hopefully, they would take a look at it. 
They also said, well, I don't have the authority to do that. I'm going to escalate to, you know, I'll have to escalate that to my manager who's not in the room. Um, these are things that don't work. Anytime I see a ticket filed, I consider it a bug, a process bug. It's a huge red flag. Tickets are fabulous for auditing. You need an audit trail. But let them be open by APIs. Let them be closed by APIs. And when they're not, you've got an organizational problem that needs to be fixed. Um, we need to orient around these workflows, and we weren't. And so well, here all this time, I'm like, are, why are engineers not getting it? Our engineers got it. As soon as we removed those blockers, they were able to deliver all of those services. So we told them they don't have to, we, we didn't tell them they don't have to follow process. We just needed to know where the blockers were, and we committed to having an executive in the room who would force things through the process. And we took notes, and we've gone back afterward, and we, and we fixed it. I'm a huge Eli Goldratt fan. Um, I'm not going to lie. B-School had a profound impact on me. It's also why I need a liver transplant. Um, just kidding, sorry. The, uh, if you've ever read The Goal, you know that you find the slowest part of your process, and you make, you make that the driver. And in our case, we found the slowest parts of the process, and by distributing those teams out within the organization, we suddenly put them closer to what their actual job was, which was to figure out the enablement of getting this code into production securely and safely. Um, it was an eye-opener for us. We were so wrong, and yet this exposed it in a matter of hours the first day. So what makes a really good EBA party? Um, everybody's there. Right? Every discipline needs to be there. We brought product people in, the technical product people, and we let them help. We let them make split-second requirements. Can I change this? Can I change this UI? Can this look differently? There were groups of peers, because we're so distributed, that had interacted for years and never seen one another face-to-face -face, because they'd never traveled. And all of a sudden, they're sitting at a table with somebody, and your interactions face-to-face -face are definitely not the flame wars of an internet bulletin board. Um, they're actually a lot more cordial and a lot more pleasant. Um, it was also in person. We flew executives in, and we made sure that leadership did everything they could to clear people's calendars and support this. Obviously, we're an operating concern. We did occasionally have to pull a person out of the room to say, look, we've got a P1 going on. We need you. Um, but we made every effort we could to clear everything off the calendars. And we celebrated. Not only did we celebrate with cowbells and gongs, um, I heard another customer brought in smoke machines and a DJ, actually, to celebrate things, which seemed pretty cool to me. Uh, I don't know. And we, we, we fed them. We had evening events for people. You know, we, we kind of sequestered them and said, this is going to be your life. What's really funny is some teams were so into it that they refused to stop working for the evening event. And we're like, they're like, we'll, we'll come a little later. We just want to make sure we get this out today. Um, this is my favorite slide. Um, the graphic designer yesterday was literally falling out of her chair laughing when I put the sheep up here. Um, I called this a Kaizen in sheep's clothing. Um, so if you've ever done any of the lean methodology and you've looked at a Kaizen, when you look at what the EBA is, it's a really fancy Kaizen. Right? I took the people closest to the problem, the engineers, the security folks, the process people, and I stuck them in a room together and I said, I'm going to invest in you guys, but I want you to rethink the process. I want you to figure out where the bugs are in this process, the bugs are in how we deliver the software into AWS compared to how we delivered it in a legacy model, and I want you to come up with these new systems. And I want you to come up with these systems in a way that's repeatable, because I can't just do these EBAs. They're, they're expensive, right? From a resource point of view, they're phenomenally expensive. I can't just do them and get a one-time boost of I made three productive days. I need this to be an accelerant. Uh, I need this process to change for our organization. So, at the end of all of this, you know, my boss came out to me and he said, look, this EBA, it creates the environment and an inflection point to bring people together, work collaboratively, and make rapid progress in areas where we had significant experience gaps. What he didn't say in this quote, um, which I trimmed and you know, took out of his email to me, was nobody believed we were going to make our date. Not me, not you, not my boss, our CEO. He said, but with the EBA, we did it. And I was absolutely shocked and amazed and it was the best thing he did. So with that, uh, Vias is going to take us home on this one, I think. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Cameron. That was fantastic. And thank you for sharing your experience. Like I promised earlier, uh, we want to cover three topics today. One was what is an EBA and how we can leverage EBA. I think we've done, uh, and thanks Cameron for actually taking us through that. And the last one is, how can you leverage uh, the mechanics of EBAs in your own organization? Now, if you look at what you heard from Cameron, I mean, the basic tenet of an EBA is to change the way you work from siloed organizations 
into an outcome-driven cross-functional teams and by changing the culture. And it's very hard to change a culture and you need to make that fun. And that's where introduce the construct of a party and celebrate each other's success. And that's what we did. And that's how EBAs are run. And the most important thing is to ensure that you have exec sponsors always there within the room to make sure that the changes are occurring. Now, uh, based on what we have done with numerous uh, enterprise customers, what we've realized is the essentials of ensuring that you can actually transform yourself on AWS is a few things, right? So one is to make sure that you align with the executive sponsorship and know what's your real goal. And I think Cameron highlighted that multiple times of Michael and himself took the onus of saying this is the outcome which we want to accomplish. And then align the strategic stakeholders uh, within the organization to ensure that they're on board. And this is where, again, in this context of SAP Conquer, we had the VP of engineering and multiple other divisions always on board and ensuring that this is a huge success for us. And then obviously break the silos, right? So be open to think that there is a potential issue in the organization and the process and a willingness to actually change and break the silos. And if you do that, the first thing which I started off with, uh, this will allow you to make the two-way door decisions, which is very important to be staying relevant in the market, and also gives you the mechanisms to make those small little changes to ensure that your enterprise will go live and get the benefits of AWS. Um, and all of this can be achieved only by learning through migration experience, and that is what the whole construction of EBA gets you to do that in a more a fun way, and, and that's what you can achieve using a D EBA. Now, how can you get started? Uh, important aspects is to get your stakeholder in terms of exec sponsor aligned, and that's the first thing which we did with SAP Concur. And once you do that, alignment with the other stakeholders, and then run a series of these EBAs. Usually one is not enough. Make sure that this process is actually uh, ascertained in your uh, ecosystem. Run more than one, run two or three EBAs. And then you'll know what it takes to actually accelerate and then use that at scale. And that is, that is the process uh, we do. And as a next step, how you can get started is actually just identify your stakeholder, identify the blockers which are blocking you as an organization uh, to get onboarded onto AWS, and then find an AWS exec, uh, AWS representative in your organization, contact them, and be ready to rock and roll in a party. And these parties are real fun. Uh, get, get these parties started and then harden and repeat this. And this is the only way you can transform your enterprise onto AWS and get the best experience using experience-based accelerator. So with that, uh, I think we come to the conclusion of the session. Uh, there are a few things which I just want you guys to be aware of. There are a few other enterprise tracks which are available. Uh, I would strongly recommend to attend at least many of these sessions to get a broader view of how you can leverage AWS to move your enterprise. Uh, and obviously, you're here to learn a lot. The training uh, learning doesn't stop here. Um, as you go back to your organizations, uh, please leverage the training and certification uh, options which we have in AWS that will always help you uh, gain that knowledge and take the best advantage of AWS. And last but not the least, uh, make sure that you complete the session survey as you move out. So we'll be here. Uh, if you have any questions, happy to take a few questions now. Uh, probably I'll be around here to take any additional questions if you have. Any questions? Yeah. Thank you. If there are no more questions, Really appreciate your time and have a fantastic reinvent going forward and enjoy the party tomorrow in replay. Thank you so much. <laughs>